when I was 17, my first real girlfriend texted me one night to be like, parents are on a date night, come over and we'll have the place to ourselves. Yep, the text that every young man waits for, the one that makes everything around you glow in gold while you hear the voice of God saying, my son, you have been chosen, now go forth and multiply. I've been planning on a night of Modern Warfare 3 with the boys, but within minutes, I was in the shower scrubbing the enamel off my teeth in order to become a little mint, drowning myself in cologne and raiding my brother's rubber stash for an entire platoon's worth. I remember texting her like, want me to bring anything over? I got a few red barons. And she just replied, nah, just bring yourself. What a feeling, dude. Girlfriend is home alone and all she wants delivered is me. So I rushed to finish off getting dressed, spent like five straight minutes in the mirror making sure I look fresh and clean, so fresh and so clean clean, and then I was ready to go. The walk over to my girlfriend's place took like 20 minutes, so from the time of getting the text to me actually arriving couldn't have been any more than an hour. She had one of those long driveways too, not like some southern manor house or anything like that, but enough so you got a long look at the house as you were walking up to it. Then right as I'm about halfway up the driveway, I see someone walking through one of the upstairs bedrooms who was definitely not my girlfriend. I stop dead in my tracks, look up at this guy, and I've got this weird mix of anger and confusion and just utterly feeling a little bit heartbroken. I whip out my phone, dial my girlfriend's number, only to find her phone is switched off. My head is just swimming with negative thoughts. I think I was about to have a panic attack, like I just couldn't believe she'd do that to me. I was checking if I had the right house, double checking the upstairs bedroom, like 100% certain that I'd just seen someone, but also telling myself, no way, I must be hallucinating or something. But nope, that same dude in the green hoodie walks through her parents' bedroom again, like all the way in and then all the way out. But on the way out, he sees me and he stops and stares at me. He's looking at me like, who are you, my guy? Where I'm looking at him like, me, who are you? But as I'm looking, I notice there's something weird about his face. It's all distorted. And then it hits me that his face is all distorted because he's wearing like literal pantyhose over his head, like a meme of a bank robber or something. Then right as I'm thinking, like, what kind of weird stuff is this? I'm like, oh no, he's not a meme. He's literally robbing the place. I just panicked and ran back down the driveway before dialing 911. But then, as I'm giving the operator all the details, I realize that my arrival might have prompted something bad to happen to my girlfriend. I ended up running back up the driveway kicking on the door and shouting up at the window, cops are on their way, you better get out of there. I added a few expletives, but I won't say them here. I didn't hear anyone shouting back, in fact, I couldn't hear anything going on inside at all. But that didn't mean there wasn't anything going on. The intruders, home invaders, whatever you want to call them, they could have been doing anything to my girlfriend in there, and that's if they hadn't done something irreversible already. Waiting those few minutes for the cops to arrive was agony, but the dispatcher promised me that they'd roll up with their lights and sirens blaring to try and scare the intruders off. We later found out that worked like a charm, but no one realized that until we were inside and my girlfriend was safe. She was scared to death, but she was okay, and it turned out that my timing had been absolutely impeccable. The two guys that broke in through the rear door of the house had only just tied her up in her bedroom and were right in the middle of ransacking the house when I showed up. And yes, they were actually wearing pantyhose. Seems kind of ridiculous, but the cops told me it's the smart choice for home invaders, I guess. You get pulled over with a ski mask in your passenger seat in Florida, questions are going to be asked. But a pair of pantyhose, you could just shrug it off and say, oh, that's just Mima's laundry day or something and there's no probable cause. Needless to say, when the cops left, we were way too shaken up for any alone time, and my girlfriend was in no mood to hang out at a place that had just gotten broken into, so we ended up going back to my parents' place to hang out. Nothing in the way of privacy, so I didn't get the 
explosive evening I'd been hoping for, but still, it was just cool to have been the one to have saved her, as she put it. I didn't save anyone. Those dudes only bailed when the cops showed up, but still, you can bet I took all the credit she wanted to give me. We ended up dating until maybe our sophomore year of college. After that, neither of us could handle the distance, but we still keep in touch and I'm pretty sure our little post-relationship friend status is rooted solely in that mild shared trauma of having confronted a pair of home invaders together. A few years ago, around Christmas time, my family decided to go on holiday to Spain for the winter. I think they were just sick of the cold as we live in a fairly small town here in Northumberland, but since I wanted to spend Christmas with my friends, I decided to stay at home. No, they didn't just leave me behind, as one friend suggested. My decision to stay in England was entirely voluntary. But sometimes I really do wish I'd gone with them because staying home alone resulted in one of the most unnerving experiences of my entire life. It was the second week of December, and it was a Friday, so it had to be the 15th. I was just chilling in the living room watching TV, deciding on which takeaway place to order from. I place an order, about 40 minutes go by, and I got a knock at the front door from the delivery driver. I grab my food, tip the guy, then head into the kitchen to plate the food up. Now I'm plating up on the counter top nearest the kitchen sink which just so happens to look right out into the back garden. It's about 7 o'clock as I'm doing this so it's almost pitch black in the garden and there's only some weak ambient orange light coming from the main road just barely illuminating the tops of the trees. At one point I just so happen to glance out the window when I see this pair of glowing eyes looking back at me through the darkness. I know I know the first thing that comes to mind is cat, and I thought exactly the same thing, that it must have just been a neighbor's cat perched up there on the back wall. So as opposed to freaking out or any other kind of irrational response, I just shrug it off, wish the cat a happy night of hunting, then trot off back into the living room to carry on watching TV. The rest of the night passed without incident. I went to bed at a reasonable hour, go me, and got a peaceful undisturbed night's sleep. The next morning I'm woken up bright and early by the sound of someone knocking at the front door. I roll out of bed, throw on my big comfy dressing gown, then head downstairs to see who's calling so early. I think I'd have been in a grumpier mood about being woken up if I wasn't so sure it was one of my mum's friends calling over to do the gardening. Mum didn't trust me to do it properly and not being out in the cold digging up weeds suited me down to the ground. Only it wasn't my mum's friend. It was the police. As you can imagine, I was a bit taken aback to see two officers stood at the door at about half eight in the morning, but since they were so polite and I hadn't done anything wrong, it's not like I was particularly nervous or apprehensive. They introduced themselves, then asked if I had any disturbances during the night. I obviously told them no, that I'd slept right through, and that's when they informed me that there had been a break-in next door. Thankfully, no one was hurt, and they were struggling to figure out if anything was actually taken, so it seemed like no big drama. But apparently the police suspected the person, or persons, to have been in the area for quite a while, and that they'd probably been casing places to pick the best target. Basically, they wanted to know if they could have a little look around the back garden to see if there were any signs of forced entry around the fence or back door. So I popped my slippers on, went around to the side gate and let them into the back garden. It was bloody freezing out, so I asked the officers if they wanted a cup of tea, then went inside to put the kettle on. When I left the officers, the atmosphere was light and friendly. Like, granted there had been a break-in, but I got the impression they thought it was just kids being daft and not some horrible, sinister stalker type thing. But when I walked back into the garden with some cups of tea, the atmosphere had completely changed. The two officers were crouched down near the back fence with one of them engaged on his radio, talking back and forth with someone who I imagine was back at headquarters or something. I don't know police things, so don't have a go at me in the comments if I get things wrong, please, but I walked over to them and 
before I offered them their tea, I kind of peered over them to have a glance at whatever they were looking at. They were clear as day. Footprints in the mud, right up near the back wall where someone had presumably climbed over. I'm stood there, holding these three cups of steaming hot tea, and right as I'm about to say something like, oh my god, was the burglar in my back garden? I hear one of the police say into his radio, like, yeah, we're gonna need forensics down here, same address I gave you. Yep, cheers, mate. When he finishes, he basically turns to me and says, Bit of bad news, ma'am. We're going to need access to your garden, probably well into early afternoon. Obviously, I had absolutely no objections to this, and the police turned up, took a plaster cast of the shoe print, or however they do it these days, and took a statement from me before they left. At first, I just told them the same thing I'd said when they'd first called round and that I'd not been disturbed during the night and had not seen anyone sneaking around the garden or the fields behind it. But then, I stopped to consider the placement of the boot prints. They were right near that back wall, right where I'd seen the neighbor's cat eyes glowing in the darkness. I had seen something, right around the time the police suspected the burglar to be in the area too, but it was just a cat, right? It was just a cat sitting on the wall right where the burglar had been stood near the back of the garden. I remember stopping for a moment and the police officer definitely assumed I'd remembered something because they gave me this exact look as if to say, go on. All the thoughts about the cat and the burglar were rushing through my head and I remember thinking how ridiculous it sounded but I just said, I saw, I saw a cat. The officer looked at me like I was mental. And I swear I wanted to clarify what I'd been thinking, but my mouth just wouldn't let me. I'd sound like I was round the bloody bend, suggesting that the eyes I'd seen belonged to the sodding burglar. So, aside from mentioning the cat, I added, but nothing else. The officers still had this funny look on their face as they nodded, but they eventually thanked me for my time, packed up, and left. I didn't hear any more news about any burglar, and the neighbors mustn't have had any more break-ins, or I'm sure I'd have heard something about it. When my family got back, Mum went over to talk to them about what happened. The neighbors said they thought it was foxes at first because their cats outside food and water caddies had been rinsed and the poor things wouldn't go anywhere near them. It was only once they found an open window and some muddy footprints that they even thought to call the police and by that point, everyone is fixated on it being a person, since they were able to open a window and were obviously wearing shoes or boots. I realize how insane this sounds, and it might come as no surprise to some of you that these are thoughts that I've never expressed publicly before. I mean, why would I? People would think I was off my rocker. So naturally, there are thoughts that have always been pushed to the back of my mind, but they've always been there, festering away. Little questions like, what if the break-in, the cat's eyes, and the scared neighbor cats were all connected? What if I hadn't been looking at a cat in the darkness of my back garden that night? What if it was something else? And not even a something, a someone. Someone who wore boots could evidently open windows and doors too, but whose eyes glowed like a cat's do. Whoever that might be that had been staring right at me. I had no idea what they looked like, but they'd sure know what I'd look like, all lit up in my nice warm kitchen. Who knows, maybe they had one of those contact type things. I don't know if you've seen the Riddick movies, but that's kind of what I pictured in my mind. This is all very hypothetical, of course, most probably nothing more than a kind of primitive fear of the unknown. Maybe the only thing to be afraid of was the fact that a burglar had been standing in my back garden with me asleep upstairs weighing up whether or not to break in. That's what I tell myself anyways, because to consider anything else would be, as frightening as it would be, illogical. Back when I was just an 11 year old kid, my entire life was almost completely ruined on a Friday night in June. My mom and dad went out to some work-related event after dinner and told me they'd be back at around midnight. They gave me $20 to order takeout from somewhere, told me to not stay up too late, then just left me to it. I had a great time, 
at first anyway, just stuffing my face and watching cartoons until I passed out on the couch surrounded by candy wrappers. I'm not sure how long later, but I woke up and immediately I can tell something is different. I know it might sound weird when I say I could feel like a breeze on my face from the back door being open, but when you live somewhere for that long, I feel like you can pick up little subtle environmental changes. The point is, I got up to check the back door and what do you know? It's wide open. I didn't remember opening it before I nodded off, but since I was so sleepy, I didn't put too much thought into it. And I just closed the door, turned off the TV and downstairs lights, then started walking up the stairs to my bedroom. And that's when I hear it. The soft, barely audible sound of crying. It wasn't like a full-on bawling sound, more like softly sobbing. But it definitely sounded like a full-grown man doing the crying, and it was definitely coming from inside our house. I am like pant-wettingly scared, and when I get to the top of the stairs, I can see that someone, definitely not me, has pulled down the ladder to our attic. And whoever it was, was upstairs in the dark, quietly crying to themselves. I'm not sure I can really put that kind of fear I felt into words. And just as I begin to think to myself, just get out of there, just run to the neighbor's place, I hear the crying stop, followed by not footsteps, but movement up in the attic. That's what freezes me in place, like a deer in headlights, and all I could do was keep my eyes glued to the opening of the ceiling. I remember seeing something. It was like a monster with a red face that drooled when it saw me. But that's only because I lost a little piece of my sanity that night. A piece that I don't ever really think I got back. It obviously wasn't a monster. It was just a person. A very sick one at that. They were in the middle of a compound nervous breakdown. Complete paranoid schizophrenic. They thought they were trapped in the wrong body and so they tried to peel their face off by cutting it to find their real face. At least that's what I was told later. After they realized that they were trapped in their own body, this woman ran for her sister's place, where she was being cared for and somehow randomly picked our yard to climb into. Then, looking for a place to hide, she went up into our attic, appearing in the hatch to scare the sanity out of me. So... You can see why that might just cause a kid to, well, lose his mind for a while and rationalize it by telling themselves that wasn't a person back there. People were good. People were normal. What I saw was a monster or a demon. Anything but a person. After I ran to my neighbors, after the police went through their investigation and my parents came home and everything was said and done, I had to be homeschooled for a while and I think I had my own little psychotic break. Or rather, I know I did. It made life almost unbearable for my parents, and they were infinitely patient with me, something I'll never stop paying them back for. I suppose some of you might not care who or what I am now, but for those of you that do, be glad to know that I'm doing okay. My wife doesn't know about what happened to me when I was a kid. I never had the heart to tell her. I know all it'll do is upset her and make her worry, and I've had quite enough of that for one lifetime. I think she suspects something, though. What with the way I'm basically obsessed with home security, and maybe that's just a mark of what a good woman she is. She doesn't probe me. She just patiently waits for me to talk about whatever it is when I'm good and ready. For context, I was about 10 years old at the time, female. Now to the story, I was really excited because my grandparents were going away for the weekend and allowed me to watch their house while they were away. Since we lived right across the street from my grandparents' house, my parents said this was fine. Honestly, my parents let me do a lot of things during my childhood that in hindsight as a now adult myself, I should have never done. I have had my fair share of creepy experiences, but... By some miracle, I made it through unscathed. So as any ten-year-old with a sibling, I was excited for some space all to myself. 
My grandparents didn't leave the key, but instead let the back door unlocked for me. Stupid, I know, but it was a very safe neighborhood, and nothing had ever happened the million times before. And this detail is important, so please keep that in mind. So I make my way across the street to their house, and water the plants, feed the cats, get their mail, and do my house-watching duties. Once they're finished, I decided that I would spend my time there watching some movies and relaxing in the back room of the main floor. Time begins to pass as it does when you're engrossed in movies, and now it's dark out. I'm ripped out of my movie by knocking at the front door. I'm not worried by this. My grandparents are popular enough and do have friends that sometimes stop by. I figured that if I let the door go unanswered, they'll understand my grandparents are not home and they'll just leave. The knocking continues and the doorbell rings one or two more times and then it stops. Figuring they must have left, I happily return to my movie. Then, without warning, the knocking continues but it starts to intensify. The sounds echo through the house and it sounds like they're actually surrounding me. Whatever calm, relaxed state I was in previously is completely gone and my gut was telling me something here was wrong. I was confused as to why this person wouldn't just leave if they thought no one was here. My panic was increasing and my ten-year-old mind was racing trying to figure out what was going on. All the while, the deafening barrage of doorbells and pounding on the door continues incessantly. Then suddenly, without warning, it stops again and I've never been so grateful for the silence. I decide to summon my bravery and look out the window hoping I could recognize the car and realize that it was all just a misunderstanding. I've always been a very paranoid person and was hoping this was just another unnecessary scare. So first, a little outline of my grandparents' house. It's a one-floor house with only a front and back door that has a brick walkway leading from front to back. Okay, so there I am, starting to peek through the window to see if I can recognize the car. Instead, I am locked eye to eye with a man I have never seen before in my life. I can only imagine the terror in my eyes. I tried to examine this man. His eyes showed nothing. No fear, no surprise, no confusion. They were just completely void of emotion. I was looking to find some kindness or hope or something to try to ease my fears and tensions. Well, I found quite the opposite of that. Suddenly his face shifted more determined and he broke our gaze and just kept walking. My brain was screaming, screaming at me that something was very, very wrong. Then it hit me and I realized what my head was trying to tell me. He was going to the back of the house, the unlocked door. He was going to the back of the house, to the unlocked door. He was trying to find a way to ten-year-old defenseless me, home alone in this empty house. I'm ashamed to admit it, but I froze. Everyone, me included, always talks so much smack in horror movies when the victims freeze when the bad guys come to hurt or kill them. Trust me, I knew I needed to go move, but my body just wouldn't allow it. To say my mind was moving a million miles a minute would be putting it lightly. What do I do? Do I call the cops? Do I run and hide? Do I run to my house? All the time telling myself every second that I waste is another second closer to him getting inside. Finally, after being angry at myself for wasting this precious time, now with tears streaming down my face, I grab the cordless phone, this was back in the early 2000s, and run into the bathroom and lock the door. In the back of my head the whole time, knowing and hoping this could all still be a misunderstanding, I really didn't want to call the police. I didn't want them to come and for everything to be fine and I waste everyone's time and just look stupid. It was wildly confusing. And not to mention I was and am a very shy person. Needless to say, I knew I needed help defusing the situation, so as the child that I was, I called my mom. At this point, I was truly hysterical, barely able to breathe, let alone get out words. Somehow she was able to understand that I was at grandma's and there was a strange man walking around the back of the house. In a stern, almost angry voice, she just said that I'll be right there and hung up. I clutched the phone like my life depended on it and crouched in the corner of the bathroom waiting for the man to come in and do God knows what. I felt like I waited for hours as I gasped for air in between deep, fearful cries. The silence is broken by the sound of the back door opening and with it, my stomach dropped. 
unsure if this was my mother or the strange man whose dead eyes terrified me. After endless moments of pure terror, my mother calls out that it's her, and it's safe to come out. In one swift motion, I jump up, rip open the door, and run into my mother's sheltering arms. I just stayed there for a while, unable to speak, still processing what just occurred and feeling finally safe in my mother's arms. After a while, I was able to get out, asking what happened to the man. She told me she found him around the back of the house and immediately approached him, asking what he was doing. He stated he was looking for an address and worriedly stumbled away to his car and drove off faster than seemed appropriate. There's no way that this man was looking for an address. Why would he continue to pound and pound on the door when no one answered? Why would he walk around to the back of the house? Nothing about that looks like someone searching for an address. After asking around, I heard that sometimes people do that when they're looking to break into a house. They thoroughly pound on the door and make sure that no one answers and that no one is home when they attempt to break in. But why, when he saw that I was inside, did he continue to go to the back of the house in the most ominous way possible? I'll never know that man's true intentions that night, and honestly, I don't know if I want to know. Thankfully, we never saw him again, and no, the police were never called, not to my knowledge anyway. My mother watched the house for me for the rest of the weekend as I was too scared to return until the house was no longer empty. Obviously, the story could have ended in many horrible ways, and I'm forever grateful to my mother coming to my rescue. In hindsight, she is very lucky the man didn't have a weapon and was instantly scared off when her presence arrived. The story may not sound like much to you, but to someone who was already paranoid and afraid of most people and things, it was enough to shake me to my core. I still, 15 years later, have irrational fears that haunt me some days and nights, and I'll always be haunted by those dead, empty eyes. September 4th of 1978 was an exciting day for Scott and Amy Fandell, as their aunt Kathy was coming to stay with them for a few days in their small Alaskan hometown. The children's father wasn't in the picture anymore, and their mother, Margaret, was not only looking forward to seeing her sister, she was greatly relieved to be getting some help around the house. Little did they know, their lives as they knew them were about to change forever. When Kathy arrived in the early evening, both she and Margaret took 13-year-old Scott and 8-year-old Amy down to a local bar and arcade named Good Time Charlie's, letting them binge on soda and video games until just before 10 p.m. When the two women announced their bedtime, the children protested, but eventually allowed themselves to be driven back to the small log cabin where they lived. However, Margaret and Kathy weren't quite ready to call it a night, and after dropping the kids back at the cabin, they decided to return to Good Time Charlie's to continue drinking. Shortly before departing, Margaret told her children not to stay up too late and that they'd be back sometime after midnight. Kathy then told Scott to lock the door once they'd departed, and in reply, Scott apparently laughed. It was later established that he laughed because the door's lock was broken, and despite his insistence that she have it fixed, his mother had neglected to do so. Once their mother and aunt were out of sight, the Fandel kids decided to sneak over to their neighbor's place, the Luptons, to play with their five kids. It's not clear what a bunch of kids were doing out so late on a Monday night, but one of the neighbor kids later reported that nothing seemed amiss with the Fandel kids, who were happy and relaxed when they came over to visit. They stayed there until the noise got too loud, at which point the Lupton's mother emerged to corral her children indoors. She then shooed the Fandel children back to their cabin and told them to stay indoors. She later stated that she believed the children had obeyed her commands and returned to the cabin, and a passerby confirmed that lights were on at the Fandel place when they walked by at around 11.45 p.m. These lights were apparently switched off when Margaret and Aunt Kathy arrived home sometime between 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning. When they entered the cabin, they found a pot of water boiling on the stove. On a nearby countertop, a package of macaroni and a can of tomatoes lay untouched. The women apparently took the pot of water off the stove before clearing away the food, but 
at no point sought out the children to chide them for doing something so dangerous without parental supervision. It was later implied that the women were so drunk that they didn't want the kids to see them in such a state. On top of that, Margaret was due into work at 8.30 a.m., so as much as we can understand why we might want to get as much sleep as possible, it still seems odd that neither of the women would check on the children. As we mentioned, Margaret awoke around 8 a.m. to begin her shift, but still didn't check on her children. Aunt Kathy said she slept until noon and was the only one to check on the kids for around 12 hours. When she found they were absent from the cabin, she assumed they were at school, but the neighboring Lupton kids would later state that the Fandel kids, who they usually walked to school with, were nowhere to be seen that morning. When Margaret arrived at the restaurant she worked at, she apparently called her children's school, intending to scold her daughter for not checking in with her before she left for school. But school staff were forced to inform her that neither of her children had shown up that day. Panicking, Margaret told her boss that her children were missing, and she needed to be excused from her shift so she could look for them. According to Margaret, her employer refused and demanded she work the rest of her shift. So, instead of looking for them herself, she says she was forced to rely on her sister to find them. It wasn't until 3 p.m. that day that Alaska State Troopers learned of the children's disappearance, a full 15 hours after they'd last been seen. Upon inspection of the family's cabin, the police found no signs of any kind of struggle, but the fact there was still a pot of water on the boil when the women arrived home suggests Scott had been interrupted while cooking something. But if he'd walked outside the cabin with the stove still on, he'd obviously expected a return, so initially, the main theory was that the kids had been lured outside, then snatched before they had a chance to get back inside. Naturally, one of the first suspects was Roger Fandel, the children's absent father. He lived all the way down in Arizona, but within a week, he had flown up to Alaska to help look for his kids. He cooperated fully with the police investigation and was subsequently ruled out as a suspect. Police established that Roger and Margaret's marriage had broken down due to alcohol abuse on Margaret's part and infidelity on Roger's, and at no point did police deem Roger a danger to the children's well-being. Yet Margaret and Kathy, as well as a handful of their blood relatives, seemed to insist that Roger was somehow responsible given that his uncle Herman was a vocal proponent of taking the kids back by force. This uncle Herman was later questioned by police, and although he was honest about having said such melodramatic things, he too was cleared of responsibility. The police were so convinced Herman was lying that they actually dug up his backyard, but not a shred of evidence was found. One witness claimed to have seen a black sedan speeding away from the cabin in the middle of the night, with the driver and passenger being identified as two carnival workers. They were indeed working at the Alaska State Fair on the day the children went missing, and had moved on the next day, but it was later confirmed that Margaret had let the men stay at her home for a single night just a few weeks prior. They were mostly definitely aware of children, and definitely had access to the children, yet despite remaining suspects, the two carnival workers were never fully charged with either kidnapping or murder. Following her children's disappearance, Margaret Fandel became deeply depressed, and this only exacerbated her problems with alcohol. Two years following her children's disappearance, Margaret left Alaska behind, abandoned the very place she had once sought solace in. Shortly after she left, the cabin she and the children lived in was burned down under mysterious circumstances. In 1980, Margaret remarried and sobered up later stating that she prayed daily that the children would be found alive and well. Her ex-husband, on the other hand, firmly believes his children are deceased, saying that if they were still alive, then surely they'd have made an effort to contact him in the four decades since they'd disappeared. Margaret's brother Terry had made a handful of bizarrely specific claims since their disappearance, such as stating that Scott was murdered, but that Amy is somehow still alive. He's also stated that he believes her to be living in Anchorage, Lompoc, California, or Drummond in Montana. Terry has never fully explained why he believes his niece is living in such a specific place, and we're only left to imagine how he's come to such conclusions. Yet the question remains, 
What happened that caused the children to vanish that night that they were left alone? And if someone took them, who was it? One thing we have to keep in mind is that Scott Vandell was extremely protective of his little sister, with those close to the children saying he was Amy's devoted protector. If someone tried to take the girl, there's a very high chance that Scott would have put up a considerable amount of resistance, yet there was no evidence of such a struggle in the cabin. This suggests that the children left the cabin of their own volition, possibly enticed by someone they knew and trusted. There's also the little detail of the cabin's lights, which were apparently switched on at around 11.45, but switched off a few hours later when Margaret and Kathy returned from Good Time Charlie's. Like most children, Scott and Amy were said to be scared of the dark, so either they'd turn them off knowing they were unlikely to return, or someone else had done so. There's also the possibility that Scott and Amy simply walked off into the forest and died of hypothermia, but not a single shred of their remains had been found in the years that followed, and even if they'd succumbed to the cold and been eaten by wild animals, at least a few scraps of bone or clothing would have been left behind. So if someone actually visited the cabin and took the children, who might have the motive to do so? As we've already mentioned, the number one suspect would obviously be the children's biological father, Roger. One of the reasons Roger and Margaret's marriage had broken down was her excessive drinking, so there's a chance that Roger viewed her as an unfit mother and viewed their abduction as a kind of rescue. His surprise visit might have excited the children so much that they remembered to turn the lights out, but forgot to turn off the stove, especially if their father told them they needed to leave as quickly as possible. But why would Roger resort to abduction over some kind of appeals process? Well, it came out years later that Roger wasn't actually Scott's biological father, only Amy's, so it's highly unlikely that he would have won any kind of custody battle. But how would Roger have known the children would be alone that night? Sure, he lived down in Arizona, but that doesn't mean he didn't travel up to Alaska surreptitiously, watching the cabin for the right time to make his move before disappearing the children completely. And I do mean completely because if Scott and Amy are still alive, they'd be well into their 50s by now, having forged entirely new identities over the years, presumably with the help of their father. They'd have gone to school, maybe even college, started employment, maybe a family too, all without ever being detected. It's a plausible theory, but even saying it out loud brings it into disrepute. Sure, the kids might keep their mouths shut to spare their father any legal repercussions, but to remain totally incognito for 50-something years would be extremely difficult, and therefore highly unlikely. And so, we're forced to look elsewhere for the most probable explanation. Then, even as unlikely as it seems, we have to consider the possibility that Margaret and Kathy are responsible for the children's disappearance. The fact that Margaret claims she left her children home alone so she could carry on drinking shows just how reckless she was, even in a small town where she felt they were safe. What's more, Margaret's story is so inconsistent and nonsensical that it makes all the sense in the world to view her with suspicion. Drunk or sober, she completely neglected to check on her kids, either when she arrived home or before she left for work, then had the nerve to call Amy's school to scold her for not checking in. Then there's the issue of her boss refusing to let her leave work after finding out her children were missing. This never once had been corroborated, and no matter how troublesome her financial situation was, the idea that a mother might be content to just sit and work while her kids were in danger is extremely doubtful. However, some say these same financial troubles motivated Margaret to sell her children into a black market adoption ring, and even that her second trip to Good Time Charlie's was an effort to gain some liquid courage for what was to come. That would definitely explain the lack of a struggle, and the complete lack of any evidence regarding their whereabouts almost completely rules out the possibility of them being killed by their mother or their aunt. Maybe one day we'll read a news story in which one of the Fandel children finally comes forward. Maybe we're only one regressive hypnosis session away from an internet breaking headline. But it seems more likely that the truth is Scott and Amy's disappearance will forever remain a mystery. And in the absence of any definitive explanation, 
we find ourselves considering the most cynical of possibilities. A couple of years ago, when I was still living alone in a studio apartment, I got this really, really bad sinus infection. I have no idea how I got it. It was gross, but I just couldn't afford to take time off of work. Not so much because I was broke, although my financial sitch wasn't the best if I'm being honest. It was more because we needed to finish up on a project at work, and they needed all hands on deck, so to speak. Seems crazy to say that in a post-COVID world, now you get two weeks paid if you so much as get the sniffles, at least currently. But back then, it was hardcore office culture all the way. Anyway, about a week into this infection and just a few days off of our deadline, I decided to try at least to get rid of the gunk in my sinuses by taking some Mucinex. So I took a walk down to CVS, picked some up, went home and popped two of the little blue and white pills with a glass of water. A few hours later, I'm actually feeling considerably less congested, enough so that I'm actually able to get some work done at home. I was looking forward to the next day at the office too, thinking I'd be much more productive and my co-workers wouldn't be burdened with the sounds of my sniffling all day. I know that might sound kind of petty, but little irritants like that can really wear on people trying to concentrate. Early in the evening, I sat down for some dinner, intending to carry on my work when I was done, and that's the very last thing I remember. The next thing I know, I'm staring into the mirror in my studio apartment and I just sort of come to. The first thing that freaked me out was how my last memory was of sitting down to dinner after dark, but when I came to, it was daytime. I felt groggy, but I remember my first thought being for the project at work. I grabbed my cell phone and saw it was just after 1pm, but I didn't see the date or the day. When my boss answers his phone, I rush into some slurred apology about having passed out since I knew at least that much had happened since I couldn't account for the loss of time. But then my boss acts all confused like, why are you calling me on your day off? I stop for a second, wiggle my finger over my laptop mouse pad to turn the screen on, and that's how I figure out that it's Saturday. I took those Mucinex pills on Thursday night meaning I just totally lost almost 40 hours of my memory. If you think he sounded confused when I called him on a Saturday and apologized for being late, you can only imagine his confusion when I asked him, did I go to work yesterday? And you can only imagine my horror when he was like, yeah, why? Is everything okay at home? I had to clarify. I asked if I was there all day, if I was acting weird or anything. He gave me normal answers to everything. I've been my perfectly normal self, but at the same time, I was never there. It was like someone else had been at the controls. After we'd hung up, I was piecing together everything I'd done in those last 40 hours or so, and I realized I'd done all kinds of stuff. I'd driven my car, used knives, I think I even changed a light bulb in the bathroom. As you can imagine, I called my doctor's office almost right away no more putting stuff off, and it turned out I had an aggressively bad reaction to the Mucinex. It was a one in a million chance, but I guess I'm just lucky like that. My doctor mentioned it's a similar sort of deal to bad reactions people have to Ambien, same sort of deal. I've had some pretty messed up things happen to me in my life. I was once in a skiing accident where I straight up could have died, but nothing. Nothing has ever scared me like losing those 40 hours that I did. Like it was almost this supernatural aura about it that makes my skin crawl even today. I feel like I know what it's like to be possessed or something. Just having something other than yourself at the controls. Just living a day of your life. Just to experience it. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm EST. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, 
or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, it was all Ooze Bats. <laughs>